This has all the ingredients of a Hollywood script. An A-list dealer who seemed to have it all. But what makes this story about Richard Buttrose even more compelling is it's real. The setting is one of the most upmarket areas in Australia. Three k's that way is Millionaire's Row. The average house price is $13 million. Four k's to the east is the famous Bondi Beach. And if you head west three k's, you bump into the notorious Golden Mile, the cross, King's Cross, the suburb that never sleeps. And all of this was Richard Buttrose's turf. This is the story of Operation Connell. The target is 37-year-old Richard Buttrose, a successful restaurateur born to a life of money and privilege. He's married to Pollyanna, and together they have a two-year-old son. He calls himself the man. To his friends, he had it all. The men and women investigating his crimes are senior drug detectives working in Sydney's wealthy eastern suburbs. We received information from a community source indicating that uh, Richard Buttrose was selling quantities of drugs throughout the eastern suburbs. And with that, it was game on. The first step after any tip-off is to know as much as you can about the target. What was Richard's pattern of behaviour? And who was he meeting? Late 2008, we, we commenced surveillance on Richard from his home address at Paddington. During that surveillance, we were following him around and it was quite obvious from the outset that he was meeting people in the streets, he was meeting people at their homes, and it was obvious that he was, he was supplying drugs on those occasions. It's November 2008, and this is some of the first police surveillance footage of Richard Buttrose. We organised for a, a police operative to, to contact Richard via text. The police intercept the mobile phone number that Richard's clients use when they want to score drugs, and they begin texting madly, over and over again, but no response. Finally, on Christmas Eve 2008, they get a breakthrough. While most of us are celebrating with family and friends, Richard Buttrose answers the police text. It had taken a couple of months, but um, from that point we were confident that it um, yeah, could only get better from here. It's the second stage of the operation. In police terms, a controlled buy. We wanted to put a, an undercover operative in and basically buy cocaine from him to enable us to obtain a brief of evidence on him and to prosecute him. An undercover detective is a special kind of police officer, a chameleon of sorts, able to blend into any environment and deal with criminals from all walks of life. The operative assigned to Richard had it tougher than most. The rich kid from Paddo had a tight-knit circle of friends and reference-checked every new buyer. Very soon, the operative will meet up with Richard. He'll be wearing a wire, and he will try to buy 10 grams of cocaine. We had surveillance deployed around the vicinity of the Lord Dudley Hotel. Uh, we've got a good eye now. No need for anyone to move in. For the undercover operative, it's a, a cross between nerves and adrenaline. The Mercedes just uh, pulling left opposite uh, the Lord Dudley Hotel. He, he turned up in, in his Mercedes. And if I can see him there, he's still got his uh, brake lights on. When he turned up, the excitement level, I think, probably jumped a little bit more. The entire operation is riding on this moment. There's a friendly. I see he's walking over to the car. If Richard gets any wind that this is a setup, police will never know the true extent of his drug deal, and he'll slip through the net. Hello, Mike. Hello, Jeff. Come in. You're about to hear exactly what police did as they monitor the conversation between Richard Buttrose, the target and what police call the friendly, the undercover detective. What do you need? Ten. Ten, right. Ten, get one free. That's what you do. It may just sound like small talk, but this is crucial. While Richard has answered the police text, there's no guarantee he'll sell the officer drugs, especially if he suspects something is up. 
Is he going to give us a Christmas discount or what? You just did. You get a lift? No, I don't want to. No, eh? What a host is I'm looking after. Can I honestly tell you? Yeah? I'll get rid of him. I know you will. Come on. 11, mate. Whoa! How many have I bought off him? Has he told you? No. How do we know you anyway? Remember, Richard only sells to those who've been referred to him by trusted clients. If the undercover detective says the wrong name, a name Richard doesn't know, not only will the deal fall through, his relationship with Richard will be over. Sydney's eastern suburbs are synonymous with wealthy residents. It is littered with those born into money and those that have made bucket loads. And it is on an unassuming tree-lined street in a Mercedes-Benz that a drug dealer and an undercover police officer have met up. The police hoping their suspect will sell drugs. Come on. 11, mate. Whoa! How many have I bought off him, is he told you? No. Oh, How do we know you anyway? Oh, how do we know you anyway? It could be any answer that he does give. Richard would not like and he wouldn't deal with him again, but... How do we know you anyway? Oh, how do we know you anyway? How do we know you? True, I'm made of... Oh, come on, eh? Oh, no, that's cool. He's actually a, a personal friend. Like, he is a friend. All right? Mate, nice to meet you. Likewise, have a Merry Good Christmas. Night. You're off next week? Yep. All set. Because I've got some hostages, as I said. Yep. All right. That was hard evidence to that he was dealing drugs. Uh, we were able to purchase an exhibit. Uh, it confirmed that he was dealing cocaine, uh, and it and it commenced a relationship with, I suppose, Richard and the police, where he was selling us drugs. Now, police could have arrested Richard right here outside the pub but they could only have charged him with selling just those 11 bags. And detectives believe this is core business for Richard. So they need him to do another deal with the undercover operative. In effect, they need more evidence. But will they get it? Police try for a second meeting. The undercover detective sends a text message to Richard's drug phone. It takes a little while, but they do get a response. And this time, Police are holding nothing back. The first team of surveillance officers head to a nearby roof. On ground level, police are positioned in cars. The meeting place is the one-way street that runs alongside the Paddington Bowling Club. Right next to where the undercover police officer will wait for his dealer, Families and friends are happily enjoying the sunshine on the bowling green, oblivious to what is about to happen. The undercover detective is in place. Police have started to film, awaiting their target. This footage is straight out of the police files on Richard Buttrose. All right, it's, uh, 14, 18. A friend will sit in the car. In the car, is the same undercover officer. Half an hour in, and there's no sign of Richard. No word from the target. Has he gone cold? Worse still, has someone tipped him off? On every occasion, you get nerves at whether they're going to turn up or not, but um, that's just part, part of the course for the, uh, what the control operation is all about. It's great to see you know, we've heard nothing back from the target as yet. Still waiting word from the target. 2.25. Mm -hmm. Finally, Richard arrives. They're just parked side by side, nose to curb. This time I was in a surveillance vehicle nearby and I was recording video footage of, of the transaction and we were able to see Richard and he didn't even get out of his car on this occasion. Just talking through the window, I think. 
You're about to see one of the strongest pieces of evidence against Richard Buttrose. He is about to toss cocaine into the hands of the undercover police officer. A cocaine deal is about to go down in this quiet little cul-de-sac, or will it? The police can't hear what's happening. It's a waiting game. In one car is the cocaine dealer, Richard Buttrose, and in the other, an undercover police officer. The cocaine is in that tiny little package. 11 individual one gram bags of the drug going from Richard to the undercover detective worth a cool two and a half thousand dollars. He seemed to be just conducting business. He wasn't really concerned about being detected by police. It, was, it, it, it appeared to be simple for him. OK, the target vehicle's reversing out. Richard's Merc is so well known, he only gets a few hundred metres up the road. Stopping being approached by two more people. Okay, he's being approached by someone on the street. Yeah. Just cemented for us the fact that these guys were very active in the eastern suburbs selling cocaine. So we estimated he was at least doing 50 one gram bags, uh, if not 100 one gram bags a day. $250 a gram, um, it's, you know, it's $12,500 a day. That's a lazy 360 grand a month, over four million a year in cold hard cash. So what makes a rich kid from one of Australia's wealthiest suburbs get into dealing cocaine? Why risk it? He had it all. His father was a respected investment banker. Ita is Ita Buttrose the magazine matron. Richard has expensive hobbies. He drives in a Lotus race car team, and the car alone is worth more than 150,000 bucks. Now police have two samples of video evidence showing the eastern suburbs lad making money from selling drugs. But for a suspected drug lord, the amounts are small. It's time to up the stakes. When police next do a deal with Richard, it will be for a greater amount, three lots of 11 gram bags. They need to test just what he is capable of supplying. 10 days later, the undercover detective sends a text to the same mobile he's contacted Buttrose on before and waits at the same place. If Richard turns up and takes the bait, police will arrest him. But it's not that simple. A car pulls alongside but it's not the blue Mercedes, and it's not Richard Buttrose. They scrap the big buy. The priority is to find out who the mystery man is. He seems to know what's going on, and sells the undercover operative 11 one gram bags of cocaine for two and a half thousand bucks. Police learn the man is an associate of Richard Buttrose, and he's aware of how the business works. And Buttrose shared the phone. It was almost like a business. That was the central part of their business. One week, um, Buttrose would have the phone, the other week, would have the phone. And then uh, when they decided, they'd swap it over. But if police bring down the associate, they'll tip off Richard, and they still have to get one more buy before they can make an arrest. The undercover police officer sends text after text, trying to get Richard Buttrose to sell him more cocaine. Nobody would turn up, so I think they got a little bit suspicious of us. Police wait in the usual spot, right here near the bolo, but Richard ignores every text. Have they gone too hard, too fast? If Richard really is suspicious, then he may shut up shop and get rid of the remaining cocaine. So police change tack. They pull out the undercover officer, and that means no more buys. Instead, they rely on physical surveillance. Detectives watch Richard at his home in Paddington that he shares with his pregnant wife and their young son, and police know his routine back to front. He appeared to commence uh, what I call his drug run about the same time. Uh, he would work between 
12 o'clock and 3 o'clock or thereabouts, and he would go out and he would service his clients. Come 3 o'clock, he'd knock off. Even now, Richard is making more cash in a week than most families can make in a year. He's a drug dealer, and police must shut him down. The decision was made to follow him around. Once we observed him conduct a transaction, then he would be stopped and arrested. It's February 25th, 2009, outside the Phoenix Hotel in the leafy cashed up suburb of Wulara. Richard Buttros sells two grams of cocaine. I made the call to um, arrest Richard at that time. Buttros had pulled up on Ocean Avenue. He was surrounded by traffic. Police, including myself, approached the car, attempted to uh, get him out of the car. At that stage, he hit the gear stick and it went into neutral and he was revving the car to drive off. He had turned the steering wheel, hands going everywhere. But they managed to get him out of the car. The Mercedes, a gift from his late father, a banking industry heavyweight, is now a crime scene. OK, the time is now by my watch 12 midday on uh, Wednesday the 25th of February 2009. Uh, we've just a short time ago arrested Richard Buttrose, who at the time was driving uh, this blue-coloured Mercedes-Benz after what we believe uh, was a drug transaction that occurred uh, at a local hotel around the corner just up here. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to conduct a search of the motor vehicle now. Time by my watch is 12.06 uh, p.m. to start the search. Whatever police find in this car will be used as evidence against Richard Buttrose, and it could be devastating for him and others. Fine. It's 12.09. Uh, Got a blue and white silver tin. Inside containing a number of uh, resellable bags containing what appears to be a white powder substance. Seeing the container full of cocaine was exactly what I wanted to see. Well, I'm asking you about that, so you don't want to make a comment? Any other items in the vehicle you want to tell Richard is handcuffed, then searched. Right front pocket. 450. Almost 4,000 bucks in drug money. It's all damning evidence against Richard, but the next find could bring down not only the dealer, but some of Australia's most prominent people. Well, I find that um, quarter to one is a notepad with various names and uh, numbers next to these names. We will be seizing this. It's come to be known as the Little Black Book. There'll be a few nervous types around town today, I suspect. Police have details of the people who bought cocaine from him, his clients, his so-called Little Black Book. That will make people very, very nervous. It's had some names and, and some amounts of money, and I believe that was money that was owing to him for, for drug supply. I think that the phone numbers that were in his mobile phone on the drug run perhaps were more, more controversial. In the middle of the car search, a person called Horse actually rings the drug phone, unaware that it is now evidence to be used by police. It's currently showing four missed calls. The names and numbers of all of Richard's regular clients are in that phone. It was in excess of 250, 300 uh, names in the phone. And some of those names are very familiar. Celebrities? Movie stars, politicians, high-profile businessmen. Richard really was the dealer to the top end of town. So where'd he hide his stash? Well, Richard, the drug dealer, was also a husband and a father. And the house where he raises his young son in this street is about to be turned upside down by police. Is there anything in there that you wish to direct us to? Yeah. Uh, I've advised Richard not to say anything else. Yeah. No Inside is Richard's wife, Pollyanna. She is just days away from giving birth to their second child and has just been informed that her husband is a cocaine dealer. 
He did uh, appear upset. He was, I think he was more concerned about his wife at home and his little boy. The first time Richard sees his family, he will be handcuffed and surrounded by police. And the sniffer dog will be going all through their home. Only Richard knows what the dog will find. A family home in the stately suburb of Paddington in Sydney is about to be searched by forensic police officers and the dog squad. It is the home of Richard Buttrose, a drug dealer, and inside is his wife, due to give birth any day. Boomer the sniffer dog moves through the house. And if he sits, it means he can smell drugs. And nothing is off limits. First, the bedroom of Richard's two year old son. Then, the bedroom Richard and Pollyanna share. There's no privacy. Police have to do whatever it takes to find whatever may be hidden inside the family home. His wife being heavily pregnant, you don't want to put any undue stress on anybody. It's all right, no, wait, no. Boomer moves through every part of the house, but he still hasn't sat down. And that means he hasn't found any drugs. And now the questions are running thick and fast. If the dog can't find the drugs, where are they? Or is Richard not the big time dealer police believe? Every belonging in the family home, no matter how innocent, now has to be manually searched. There is too much writing on this to be emotional. The little bed is stripped bare. Police have to look everywhere. Could the drugs be amongst the toys? Or somewhere more obvious? Richard's study is next. On a high shelf in the beloved Lotus Car Racing Trophies, police find the first part of the drug dealer's stash. Fine. Uh, some plastic receivable bags with a white powder in them. More one gram bags of cocaine. It was almost his reserves so that he could nip home and get some more if he needed to while he was out doing his run. Just to me a total from Peggle. Then bundles of cocaine, vacuum sealed to keep the smell in. On the street, these would have netted Richard more than 12,000 bucks. And in the same envelope, proceeds from dirty deals already done. $50,000 in cash. So that concludes the search of top study. Police have now been searching for more than four hours and are satisfied they've found all the drugs. They take it all as evidence and leave Richard's wife to collect her thoughts. It was almost six months worth of work we put into this, uh, into this job and um, I felt I knew a lot about him at that stage. Um, but I, f I thought there was also more to come. Richard is charged over the money and on four counts of supplying a prohibited drug. And detectives are convinced that's all the drugs they're going to find. So Richard applies for bail and the Buttrose family pay the $300,000 surety. And within 24 hours of his arrest, he's free to return home. But what Richard doesn't realise is that police are about to get a fresh tip-off. This case isn't over yet, not by a long shot. The next day, we've received information that um, there was possibly another house that he had in Darling Point. Richard has a secret apartment, and that secret premises is located inside this red brick waterfront high-rise. If this is, in fact, Richard's safe house, detectives can't waste any time. They have to use a locksmith to get in. 
Richard is out on bail. He may even be at the apartment right now. We weren't quite sure what we'd find. Um, we ended up getting access into the place. Police! 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 All clear. <laughs> and it was just a normal run-of-the-mill apartment, and um, it had been, you know, like it had been renovated. Small kitchenette. And uh, we started our systematic search of the premises. Police are looking for anything that might link Richard to the apartment. Proof he's been here. The bedroom on the face of it had a bed and nothing else, really. It was only when we opened up the cupboards. Can you just open them up if there's nothing in there? Is it just a photo of Richard Buttrose? So we had no doubt that this premises was linked to Richard. Knowing it's his place means they now have to go through it thoroughly, but they don't need to look very hard. The first find was opening one wardrobe and finding a box. The box itself is one of the mill, but what's inside will take everyone's breath away. When uh, Senior Constable Taylor found the Kennard's box, uh, it just sent shivers through everyone's spine. Large quantity of money. Money and bucket loads of it. Yes, 5.01 a.m. <coughs> what most of us can only dream of. Bundle after bundle of cash. Each bundle is $5,000. Police begin counting how many there are. Five, 10, 13, a sea of 50s. And before long, they're covering the bed. Police keep counting the never-ending bundles of drug-dealing cash. If only they knew this was just the tip of the iceberg. Police officers have been searching Richard Buttrose's secret waterfront apartment for 15 minutes, and they're about to discover exactly how much money they've uncovered from the cardboard box in the cupboard. We thought we were onto something big here, and yeah, obviously it turns out we were. So going on that, that would be 250,000 in cash, if the, if the figures are right, roughly. A quarter of a million dollars, and they've only searched one room. What on earth will they find next? Having found the money just reinforced to everybody that this was a safe house and that uh, we had to thoroughly search the place to make sure that we weren't going to miss anything else. Just continue searching. Mm -hmm. Two drawers are empty. Yep. Any time you do it, police work, it's, it, you know, some days are mundane and other days are, you know, you're pumped up. And these, these were days where we were pumped up. The search has now become a big job. Some officers bag the cash. It's now evidence. Others keep searching, not knowing what else could be stashed away. It's just a matter of minutes before, yes, that's another find. Find something? OK. Find here in the wardrobe is a box with a, looks like a used doona on top. And one lifts the doona. More cold hard cash. What we might do is just to get some photographs. When the second box in the same room was found and there was more money, it started to blow us away and it was just so tightly packed that we knew that we'd uh, hit pay gold. Yeah, I'll just get some gloves and help you. This is good. Just to see the bundles of money, it was amazing. You generally don't see that in a lot of operations. Further proof, Richard ran one of Australia's most successful cocaine businesses. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. So, five thousand. Six months worth of, of work on a, on a job, and then it comes to this, and you you see, you know, all this money laid out on a bed in front of you, and you think, well, you might have done a good job here. And now for the hundreds. And there are bundles of them. One, two, three, four, five, fifty bundles. 
10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 bundles of 10 each of hundreds. That's a total million dollars on the bed. One million dollars. More money than most of us will see in a lifetime. And that's on top of the 250,000 bucks they found earlier. In total, a whopping $1.25 million until now that was sitting in boxes in what was a normal looking suburban apartment. All that money was drug money. It was money earned through the proceeds of sale of uh, cocaine. Meanwhile, Richard Buttros is just five kilometers away on bail. He has no idea police have found the loot. His money. And there could be more to find. Yeah, it's all clear. The search continues. It's clear. You can't, we might just want to know if he's apparently just fine in those drawers. Um, 702 PM, just a small set of scales. The scales are tools of the trade when you're selling one gram hits of cocaine. It looks like flour, but this substance could turn a small amount of coke into many drug deals. Flour. Uh, could have a cutting agent too. Doesn't do a lot of cooking though. No, it's, it's using cutting it. I think he'd be cutting it a bit. Right. There should be an oimy number on the side of it. Oh, uh, hello. And believe it or not, more cold drug dealing cash. But so far, no cocaine. But three hours in, and bingo, little white bags full of cocaine. It has what appears to be a, one of those um, sealable um, freezer storage bags with a number of other sealed food saver bags inside. Pre-packaged coke, ready to hit the streets of Sydney. An unknown quantity of small clear silver bags with white powder. And still the search goes on. Next, the police find further proof. This was big business for Richard Buttrose. Multiple mobile phones. Have you guys finished yeah, with this? Mate, put, put it on the table, actually. Four hours down, and the search is now in its final stages, but it's far from over. This is um, time by my watch is uh, 9.24 p.m. Just um, fine with a number of uh, um, food savers sealed bags again with the white uh, powder substance. Located in a Fraser motorcycles bag, red, black, and green color. It appears to be five sealed bags with a large amount of um, smaller resealable bags inside. What you're now seeing is unequivocal proof that Richard Buttros was a drug lord. But what's in the bag will be more than police ever expected and will shock even the most seasoned officer. Police searching Richard Buttrose's apartment are about to get the shock of their lives. Even they will not believe what they're seeing. Inside. Contained within one Coles liquor land. Hey! White powder substance. from overseas. That's how it's been imported. At that moment, I probably thought jackpot. I think we've, we've nailed this. That's close to about 1.2 kilos. A block. That one? One block. That block there. Let's go. 
What's what? I don't understand what that is. That's oh. obviously the uh, syndicate who have actually packaged it overseas. Everyone was just exhilarated by the fact that we'd actually struck gold. Hard blocks of uncut cocaine direct from overseas. That block, just under a kilogram, has a street value of $1.8 million. All up, the 5.9 kilograms of cocaine would have earned Richard $10 million in deals. Six bags of white powder. And this is how he would do it. He'd take a brick of cocaine and flesh it out with that white substance known as a cutting agent. He'd use the scales to weigh out one gram, put that gram in the tiny clip seal bag, and then vacuum pack a bundle of the bags to transport them easily. The blocks had a stamp on them. From inquiries I've conducted in relation to that stamp, it's revealed that that stamp is a, a Peruvian, it's called a tumi, a tumi, which is a, a Peruvian ceremonial knife. So it, that leads us to believe that that's the marking from the source country, being Peru. So the cocaine from South America would hit the streets of Australia and the hands of Richard Butros's A-list clients. In total, police have found more than $1.3 million in cash, 5.9 kilograms of cocaine. It had a total street value of $10 million. Detectives have no doubt that Richard Butros is the cocaine king to the A-list. He was just a go-to man who you can get one deal gram bags from. But Richard still has no idea that police are aware of the full extent of his drug dealing operation. But he will in eight hours time when he reports to the Rose Bay police station as part of his bail. And it was at that, that time that Richard was re-arrested by Paddington detectives who um, charged him with the larger uh, offence of uh, commercial supply of cocaine as well as the uh, deal with proceeds of crime in relation to the money. I could just tell by the look on his face that um, yeah, he, he was at the point where, yeah, you've got me. Richard Buttrose was using and dealing in cocaine. Knowing the evidence that police have, Richard Buttrose pleads guilty to supplying a large commercial quantity of cocaine. The most time he could spend behind bars for that crime is 25 years. 36-year-old's famous aunt told the court she was absolutely shocked to hear he was taking drugs. He was the last person in the world. Richard Bartros broke down in tears as he told the court he began using it recreationally. I understand it's wrong, however in the circle of friends I mix in, it's much like having a glass of wine. When I got arrested, my drug use was out of control. I started snorting cocaine myself and bagging it up. I was obsessed with it. His wife sat sobbing in court. Richard's partner in crime has also pleaded guilty. On the 18th of March, 2010, Richard Buttrose was sentenced. He had a life of wealth and privilege as a member of the A-list party set of Sydney's eastern suburbs. But now Richard Buttrose will spend the next 12 years in prison. I have absolutely no comment. You're wasting your time. We are satisfied with the sentence, yes. A sentence the judge hopes will send a clear message to others in society that if they get caught selling drugs, they will face serious jail time. Richard Buttrose will be locked away from his wife and two children until at least 2021. Richard wasn't there at the birth of his baby daughter. He was in jail. She was born two days after he was arrested for the drugs and cash in that apartment. And all that money. $1.3 million and the money in the car and the family home. Well, that was all confiscated as proceeds of crime, as was the apartment. But the gap that Richard left in the Sydney drug market has already been filled. It could be the dealer that's taken his place that police are watching right now. They have their eyes on many Australian drug lords.